Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're gonna be talking about how fast we can sort 1 million elements in F sharp. All right, so why are we doing this? Well, last week I did a little investigation into how fast I can sort 40,000 elements in TypeScript to uh, basically win an argument. And if you've been following along for any time, you know that I'm kind of like a fan, uh, maybe like a cult fan of F sharp, maybe not that healthy. And so it got me wondering, you know, the TypeScript results were actually a lot faster than I had anticipated. So if F sharp is supposed to be a little bit faster and I like it a lot more, um, let's see what it does and how it compares. So that's the question we're going to be answering in this video, um, really exploring how fast we can sort a large n list of elements in F sharp. Um, and of course there's sort all sorts of variables. So we're going to explore this in a few different ways. I'm um, using different list sizes and also uh, with different data types. So the high level answer uh, for how long it takes to sort a million elements in F sharp uh, depends on, of course, course, the type quite significantly. Um, here we have the percentile or the 90th percentile of this. So this should be a decent upper bound. I'm um, not quite like the, the highest we've seen, but a decent upper bound of what you can expect for actually sorting this. Um, in relative order of performance or speed, uh, first we have just regular ints. These are in 32s uh, finishes and about 359 milliseconds. Sorting objects that have a property of an int and sorting on that property um, finishes next, just over about one second. Sorting just strings. These are actually just um, those ends turned into strings happens in about three seconds. And then if we sort on a uh, object's property that is a string, we get about four seconds. So that's the kind of the answer from like a high level. Um, and in the rest of this video, what we're going to do is kind of dive into more of what we did to actually get these results. A uh, reason being that, you know, all benchmarks have asterisks. And so I think it's really important to bring context to what we actually did to, to get these results before you like go run off and, and use it. And it doesn't actually work in the real world. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the benchmark setup. So kind of just what the benchmark is from a high level. Um, and then and we're going to talk about the results and kind of go into more of how F sharp performed for different sizes from 10 to a million um, for each of these different uh, data sets and data types. And then finally, I'm going to dive in a little bit into the code uh, so you can actually see what the benchmark is doing and how it's getting these results. Um, finally, I'll leave you off with next steps for how to get all this code, run it yourself, uh, use the same instance that I did, um, but we'll get to that later. Okay, first, uh, benchmark setup and kind of how this whole thing works. So uh, first, I want to start with like two goals that this benchmark had. Uh, first one is just simplicity and the second one is reproducibility and we'll talk about each of these. So first benchmark simplicity, I had like three things I was trying to achieve. One, I want it to be simple to create um, because this is kind of like a best effort experiment I'm doing in my spare time. So hopefully it didn't take like more than an hour or two to get fully running and, and be happy with it. And um, the second one is I want it to be simple to understand because one, I want to make sure it, it actually works. And the best way to do that is just make it super easy to understand. Um, but two, I wanted other people to be able to use this themselves and, and kind of learn from it and, and kind of run it themselves. And if it's not easy to understand, nobody's going to do that. Um, and the third is if it's simple, it should be easy to reproduce. And again, if it's you know not simple, probably harder to reproduce and reproducibility is key, I think for benchmarks. Um, so simplicity kind of feeds into all of that. And so now let's talk about what do I mean by reproducibility? Well, when I was thinking about this, I basically had two categories I was I was kind of thinking about. One is like the code itself. Can we reproduce what the code is supposed to do? And so for this, I really wanted the benchmark that I wrote to be really self-contained with basically no external dependencies. You don't have to like NuGet or anything like that. Uh, basically, you can just take the code that I have, um, copy and paste it and run it anywhere you can run F sharp and it should just work. The second one is the machine. Um, I think this is a source of a lot of different results in benchmarks. Um, and so the simplest thing I could think of to make sure that we could reproduce the, the whole basically run runtime and machine um, that we're using is to just use something available to everyone. And so I'm just using the free replit instance uh, using the official F sharp template just has half of vCPU, 512 megabytes of RAM and one gigabyte of storage, which theoretically is, is unused. But the point here is that you should just be able to take the benchmark code that I'm sharing today, spin up a free replit instance for your browser and run this and get the exact same results that I have. Or if yours are different, then you know, it's at least easy to, to run it yourself. Okay, so that's the benchmark from a high level. Now let's dive into a little bit more of the results that we have. So again, from a high level for the 1 million elements, basically the order in which uh, they run performance wise is just primitive ints and then an object property that is an int and then strings and then object property that is a string. And this kind of makes sense intuitively for the kind of overhead involved with like comparisons. Um, the ints are probably going to be the simplest. And then if you have to access an object first before you can get to the ints, then that's probably going to be harder. Strings are just harder to compare typically than ints. Um, and then the same with the object property averaging overhead on that. 
I will say that in the TypeScript one, we didn't quite see this as simply and obviously, but intuitively, I think this makes sense. Now onto the results themselves. So to get the results here, basically ran this uh, 200 iterations of each. I was thinking about doing more, but that itself already took like 10 minutes. Um, so I didn't want this to take too long uh, to actually run the benchmarks. And so here we can actually see something interesting that like until we get up to the 100,000 mark, uh, we're actually right on the 300 milliseconds line, um, which if you remember back or, or looked at the TypeScript one, that was how fast we could 40K. So this is um, typically much faster uh, than our TypeScript as expected, um, but we can actually sort quite a lot within uh, you know 300 milliseconds, which is something to keep in mind if you know you ever thinking about doing something in memory, it might actually be you know reasonable. Now definitely when we get up to the 1 million level when we're getting into like a second plus this is like definitely give you pause probably like don't do this but i'm actually pretty impressed with with how much we can sort uh pretty fast. Now, a lot of people talk about how like a cold runtime and a hot runtime might have different um, results. Maybe if it's cold, it things go slower. And if it's hot, things go go faster. Um, and so I did redo the uh, number list um, sort just to see. Uh, these actually came out about the same. Like I don't really see any big differences here. So um, I don't think the, the hotness of the runtime is really affecting us here, nor did we even see that in, in the TypeScript one. So I'm not sure that's even a thing that, that happens that often, but um, something to, to check just in case. Now, all I have here are the P90 results. Um, the benchmark itself outputs a lot of different other things like the P50 and averages and stuff like that. If you're interested um, in seeing those, you can go rerun the benchmark yourself and just look at it. Um, I'll have links to that in the next section. All right, now to actually look at the code that runs this benchmark. So we're, we're basically just going to look at this from a high level because um, it's basically a direct port of the TypeScript benchmark I did last week. So no need to like dive too deeply into it. Um, but basically, we've just got three parts. One, we've got a benchmark timer that does the actual actual timing. Um, we have our benchmark scenario, which is the actual thing to run. So you can imagine it just creates its list of items that it needs to have sorted. Um, and then it calls the benchmark timer to actually go run the sorting of it. And that's how it gets its time, but also sets up its data. And then we just have a benchmark runner, which is basically going to just provide a nice API for us to run the scenario, uh, however many times we want it to run. Again, in this situation, it's 200 times, um, and then take all those results and summarize them nicely to get the median, the average, uh, the P90, it's now again, for all this code, you can find it um, here in the, my blog post. And then if you want a deeper explanation, um, including kind of walking through the code, uh, you can look at the video that I put out last week. Um, it does this pretty well. And it's basically the same code, just, you know, TypeScript versus F sharp, but basically everything else is the same. So no need to go over it again here. And that's it. So all code, um, also the link to uh, run the actual benchmarks in Replit should be like a public sketch. So you can just kind of go to the link and run it on a free instance. Um, all that's available here in the blog post. And if you made it this far, you're probably interested in F sharp. So if you're interested in looking into how to build your own web APIs with it, uh, check out this tutorial that I put out using F sharp and giraffe, which is basically how I build all my backends these days. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.